Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament Lectionary Podcast. I'm Rosie Candlethal. And I am the Reverend Dr. Rachel Wren, an ordained Lutheran pastor and assistant professor of biblical studies at Trinity Lutheran Seminary. Our fabulous co-host, Tim McNinch, is off this week. So let's dive right in. It's just kind of a funny, like, he's not here, so let's get going. He's like, let's get to work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tim. We're still in ordinary time on this 19th Sunday after Pentecost, October 16th. We're sticking with the thematic or complimentary first reading, the one that relates to the gospel lection for this date. And that brings us to Genesis 32, verses 22 to 31. The story of Jacob wrestling with someone. We're not really sure. It's a little ambiguous. So Rosie's up to bat. So what do you got here, Rosie? Yeah. First off, right, we've got a great story with some really interesting features in the Hebrew, as Mm. Rachel already kind of hinted at there with we're not really sure who (laughs) Jacob's wrestling with. But before we get there, as usual, often with this, we need to fill in some significant background because we are picking up in the Mm -hmm. middle of things in Genesis 32. Mm -hmm. So the story of Jacob's wrestling, while short, is a critical memory in the way that Israel imagines its own story and identity in the world. Mm. So it's both a story about a single character, Jacob, who becomes Israel, uh, but also it's a story about the people who identify with Israel. So Mm -hmm. it's a a larger story about the nature of faith and maybe even the, the very meaning of struggle in our existence. Wow. Yeah. I mean, okay. So not to make it big or anything, uh, wh- where do you want to start tackling this story? What, what do you want to say about Jacob? Who is he? What do the preachers need to know? So Jacob is huge. I'm, yeah, preachers are probably familiar <laughs> with the story, but we'll just sort of give the little um, pricey here. Jacob's story stretches from Genesis 25, pretty much through the end of the book, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but for starters, Jacob is the twin brother of Esau, who, if you'll remember, cheated his brother out of his blessing as the firstborn. Mm -hmm. Um, So years earlier, when their father Isaac was nearly blind and toward the end of his life, Jacob dressed up like his brother Esau and successfully tricked his dad Isaac uh, into giving him his brother's blessing as the firstborn. So that, um, children, is the history of Halloween. (laughs) Wah, wah. (laughs) Right, just in time. Uh, Yeah, so if you're looking to dress up like your brother or sister, (laughs) there you go. For what purpose? But anyway, Esau, as a result, promised to get his revenge on his brother. Um, And as a result, Jacob took off running for his uncle Laban's for refuge. Uh, We're at the point in this story, he has been living and working as a shepherd for almost 20 years, and he's been going through it. He's now married with a couple of wives and concubines, lots of children, probably lots of drama (laughs) and animals. Um, So toward the beginning of Genesis 32, which is where we're kind of getting close to our reading here, Jacob is unsure about whether his brother is still angry. He's left his uncle's house and he's now looking to make a new home with his family. But he sends out a messenger to Esau to test the waters. So basically like, hey, Esau, it's me, Jacob, your long lost brother. I know I've been gone a while and I probably um, probably have some bad memories about what I did to you. But I've actually done all right for myself. I've got a wife and kids, some servants and animals. And well, I hope we can let, you know, bygones be bygones. (laughs) Well... So at the start of the story, the messengers return to Jacob with the report that his brother Esau is on his way to meet him, but with 400 men accompanying him. (laughs) Love that detail of the story (laughs) so much. It's just, oh yeah, he's on his way to meet you with 400 men. I mean, it's just the perfect freak out. Like not the way Jacob hoped that would go, right? Probably not, right? Um, So Genesis 32, verse 7 is pretty explicit. It reports Jacob's reaction. He is terrified and panicked uh, and starts figuring out, oh my God, how am I going to survive an attack from my maybe justifiably angry brother? Mm -hmm. So he divides up the people. It's a strategy to try to help some of his folks survive. So he he divides up his people and some animals into a couple of groups to try to give them the best chance to get away uh, Mm -hmm. under an attack. And then uh, just to cover all his bases, he starts desperately praying to God. Uh, And the prayer is recorded, which is pretty cool. So it says, basically, look, God, you said you'd protect me. And here I am in a mess of trouble. I'm terrified of my brother. I think he's going to kill me and my family. And well, God, you said you'd protect me and that I'd have more descendants than the sands of the sea. Mm -hmm. So you have got to help me out here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny because it's either like a continuation of Jacob's tricks where he's just trying to like pull out all the stuff that he can, or it's the most sincere 
moment that we get with him, which is a really interesting, vulnerable place to begin our pericope for today, right? That's such a good point, right? Because this ambiguity around Jacob's character is maybe even uh, uh, something that might be familiar to listeners too, is, yeah. you know, we hedge our bets with God yeah. sometimes, you know, <laughs> uh, we we do everything we can humanly possible. Um, and then we make our, you know, Hail Mary prayer yeah. just to make sure, right? And and that is so real here in this story. And so if, if listeners could even connect with that in their own lives, you know, Mm -hmm. where you do everything you can, and then you make the prayer and then you just kind of have to wait, right? Cause you, Mm -hmm. you've at that point done everything you can. So here is this amazing prayer that gives us insight into Mm -hmm. Jacob as a character and maybe even some insight into ourselves Mm -hmm. as well as, as all this important background to what Jacob's thinking and feeling as he prepares to meet his brother the next morning. This is where we pick up in our first reading in verse 21 Jacob is unsure of what will happen when Mm -hmm. his brother arrives. He doesn't know if he's going to survive or his family or what's going to happen. He's done what he can, but he can also see his own limitations and what he's brought upon himself Mm -hmm. through his betrayal of his brother. So Jacob can only pray that God will save him. And he prepares a nice present to try to soften Esau up. And he sends that along ahead with the rest of his family across the river. Mm-hmm. When we get to verse 24, he is alone. Uh, and at that point, a mysterious man appears and attacks him in the night. Oh, okay. So staking a claim there. You called him a man. Some people jump right to God. Some people say Jesus. Some people say angel. So you said man. All right, flush that out. Right. And I want to be, I want to try to do this for listeners. So here's the thing. It's not really clear who or what mm-hmm. this being is. The Hebrew calls the wrestler an ish, a man, in verse 25. But then in verses 29 and 31, it's an Elohim, a divine being. Uh, Now, later on in the Bible, it's reinterpreted, right? So Hosea 12, 14, the prophet identifies this being as an angel. But the story here in Genesis deliberately leaves some ambiguity and mystery mm. to the account. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's there in the language that the, the Bible's reticent to name exactly what this being is. And I want to restore here for our listeners is some of the mystery and awe and real fear that mm-hmm. is in this encounter. This story is often told in comforting tones kind of for Sunday school audiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's wrung out of all its darkness and uncertainty. But the circumstances here are actually quite threatening if you Mm -hmm. can put yourself there, right? So Jacob is alone on the banks of a river at night, and he's attacked by and for him an unidentified assailant. He is fighting all night long and refusing to let go. It's only toward daybreak, right, that the story tells us that the being finally wrenches Jacob's hip in desperation and begs to be released. And I think it's worth pointing out here some of the like ancient Near Eastern background that's in the story. There's lots of folk traditions, even to this day, about night spirits that are not permitted to travel Mm -hmm. in daylight, right? As well as folk traditions about guardians or trolls that block access to rivers and bridges and passageways. These stories, they persist today. They remain part of human memory. And some of this background deserves to be remembered here. Uh, It's not clear what kind of intentions this nameless wrestler has towards Jacob. Perhaps it is not benevolent from his perspective. Maybe it has more sinister intentions. Maybe this is Jacob's past coming back to wrestle Mm. with him in some Mm. ways, right? Jacob doesn't know from his perspective, he just has to hold Mm -hmm. and he refuses to let go of this unknown attacker. Now we have seen this theme of wrestling throughout Jacob's life. Um, Jacob is the one who hangs onto his twin brother's heel at birth. In fact, that's kind of where his name comes from. Yehov is to uh, one of the meanings is the the one who hangs on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, It's a, a reference back to his hanging on to the heel of his firstborn brother when he's uh, a twin in the womb. (laughs) He also struggles with Esau and his father and with God throughout his life. Mm. He struggles with his uncle Laban over and over again. He tricks and he's been tricked before. Wrestling, striving, that's a theme of Jacob's life. And here it is again in this culminating moment of his life story. There's also a lot of interesting Hebrew wordplay in this passage, uh, which can easily get missed in the English translation. But I'd like to uh, take a moment just to point some of it out for listeners. So that word for wrestle is actually quite unusual. It's derived from the stem of ak, which is um, ayin, bait, uh, kof. And this is the only place in the Bible where we find it. 
That mm-hmm. word avak is translated as wrestle in the Hebrew, uh, but carries the sense of to embrace one another mm-hmm. um, and hence to struggle and wrestle, to be so close um, that you're, you're, you're wrestling through that moment, which I kind of really love and want to mm-hmm. evoke for our listeners. That word avak also sounds like jabak, like, and like Jacob. So mm-hmm. uh, Yaakov and Yabok, right? So some scholars have explained the use of this rare Hebrew word for wrestling as a part of the intense wordplay that's in this narrative. Oh, yeah. I mean, intense wordplay is a, is a great way to say it. And not just with the words, but with the names itself. I mean, what's happening here in terms of names and naming? Right. So this is a critical story for, for that. Um, we can't be sure who wins this wrestling match. The yeah. being strikes Jacob and puts his hip out of joint. So it seems as though, you know, he kind of cheats a bit. <laughs> um, and then he begs to be released before daybreak. But Jacob insists on getting a blessing first. And the being asks, what is your name, right? Mm. The being in verse 28 says, okay, here it is. You're not Jacob, the grasper of heels, uh, the one who takes another's place by force, the supplanter. Mm -hmm. These are all various translations for Yaakov, but you are now Israel. There, as the day breaks, Jacob is named Israel. A new name, a a new story uh, Mm -hmm. to make up the blessing that Jacob has demanded uh, and asked for. But this also represents the high point of this whole ordeal. Names are intertwined with destiny and personality in the Bible, and Jacob receives a new name. But it's also not so clear what that new name means for his future. Critically in the Bible, he is referred to both as Jacob and Mm -hmm. as Israel. So it Mm kind of goes back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. Both of these identities are still a part of Jacob and a part of Israel's history. So uh, writ large, right? So while the story claims that Israel means, or Yisrael means he who has strived and won, the word Yisrael in regular Hebrew diction, where the subject is last, usually means God strives, not mm. he strives with God as the story claims, right? Mm. So in some way, this name preserves that um, rich back and forth, the yeah. ambiguity there uh, in our relationships with God of, of who is this subject and who is the object, like who's being mm. wrestled and who's striving and who's prevailing, right? And perhaps it's just a reminder there about the uncertainty and struggle in any encounter with God. There is something in the mystery of this naming that preserves the value of struggling with God Mm -hmm. and that, you know, this is a defining feature of Jacob's life and perhaps the life of any person of faith. Mm, I can, I mean, you're, you're, you're getting your preacher tone on there. Like I can hear you (laughs) heading towards preaching points there, right? Can I throw just one story out there? Yes, please. I I got a, I was in the parish and I did the, the terrible thing that we're trying to help preachers avoid where I only read the gospel lesson for that day. And so that's what I wrote my whole sermon on. And I literally, I don't know what week was happening, but that's all I read. I get up in the pulpit and I open up to, to the first reading and it's Jacob. And I was like, oh, I love the story of Jacob. And so I got up in the pulpit and I said, hey, folks, we got two options. I have this sermon that I wrote. I didn't realize that it was Genesis 32. And I love that story. So which do you want me to preach on? The one I wrote? Or do you just want me to talk about Genesis 32? And they said Genesis 32. So I just talked about the the story because I love it so much. (laughs) So So you just riffed right there? Yeah, it's the only time I've ever done that before. But I just I just love this story so much. So yes, I think it lends itself to rich preaching. Absolutely. Don't do that, friends. Take Rosie's pointers here and actually craft a sermon about it. But there is just something about this story that is irresistible. Right, so Rachel's really pointing to the fact that this text, right? I mean, you can really yeah. just almost let the text itself speak because yes. you didn't really have to craft a, a sermon beforehand. The text invites so much reflection, right? So yes. that's perfect for underscoring that, right? There's so much mystery, so much yeah. depth, so much connection that we can find between the character of Jacob and ourselves. I mean, because he's not someone that's perfect, right? right. You can point to his background and he's not someone that you're going to put up on a polished pedestal right this guy is a street fighter he's a trickster he's someone who will get down in the dirt and wrestle with a mysterious attacker and then somehow survive right so 
He is persistent in that way that we love our underdogs to be. He (laughs) hangs on even when he doesn't understand, maybe perhaps especially when Mm. he doesn't understand. And then he demands a blessing from the encounter, which is audacious, but also just a a beautiful thing for us to consider, right? The gospel lection too, that's paired with this reading is from Luke chapter 18 for this week. Mm. So the story of the persistent widow and the unjust judge. Mm. I do not love that story. It is awful that a widow would have to keep bugging this callous judge to do what's right to help her to survive. But both the gospel reading and our first reading from Genesis 32 teach us something. God doesn't always appear as a loving friend who listens to our prayers and gives us the warm and cozies. In both of these testimonies from Jacob, who wrestles with a mysterious assailant in the night and survives, but will always walk with a limp. Yeah to the widow who has to irritate a judge into giving her what she needs, God is depicted as fierce and tough. This is not a God who can be tamed into our church houses to hang up on our walls in neat frames. Hmm. These are messy pictures of a life of faith. And these pictures of God include the elements of fighting, of struggle and persistence, and the deep uncertainty of any encounter with the Holy One. Yeah. So my preaching point would be to let the wildness, the physicality of these texts touch you, to wrestle with you, if I may, Mm. and then to demand a blessing from your encounter with the text. Don't let go. These passages, as you just said, these passages preach. Mm. They are not neat. They speak to a reality that many people in our congregations already recognize. They Mm. don't need a whole lot of unpacking. They understand struggle. They know that faith in God, or for that matter, in anyone, Mm. involves a certain amount of getting down in the dirt and being willing to fight and sometimes to just hang on through the night and survive until the morning. There is risk involved in relationships for everyone, but the lesson here is also there is also blessing, but it requires a certain amount of just grit to hang on sometimes. Yeah. Amen. I feel like you're preaching to me just by (laughs) reading your preaching tips. Like it's so, it's so good. And there's so many directions you can take it. There's, I I was at a funeral once. I was not at it. I was leading, I was presiding at a funeral (laughs) once. And this, the guy who died, his son, it was an older guy, um, had, had a a significant number of issues throughout his life um, and a really big family who just really adored him. Um, and one of the things he had was he had a physical limp. He, he walked with a limp for most of his life. And his son got up and gave this eulogy that I still get teared up thinking about. And I'll never forget because he, he got up and he said, my dad spent his whole life walking with a limp. But when you walk with a limp, people with little legs can keep up. And it was just this this moment. And he went on to like describe the way his dad's pain and suffering and afflictions allowed him this this deep sense of empathy for people who felt powerless like children or for people who felt left behind that the world moved too quickly for them. I mean, it was just this gorgeous eulogy. I I didn't want to preach after it. It was perfect. It was everything that needed to be said. Um, So T- taking just that one idea of a limp, there are so many different directions that you could take this story. Um, and I think wonderful. you've, you've lifted mm-hmm. up some gorgeous ones. Now there have to be pitfalls though, right? Like, is there, are there any pitfalls you would want to warn preachers away from? I mean, m- my major pitfall here is in taming the story, right? Yeah. This story of Jacob's wrestling is wild. Uh, I, I mean, it really does. It doesn't take much to paint the mystery and uncertainty in the story for our congregations. Mm-hmm. To foreclose on that by making Jacob's encounter and his naming of, you know, foregone conclusion, a neat way of ending, I think is to really miss out on a real opportunity to bring this story to life. Mm-hmm. Um, in a moment where a lot of people are facing uncertainty and are looking for examples of, of how yeah. to hang on, right? Yeah. The gospel election, let it help you for this week. Um, That's not an easy story either from Luke. The persistent Mm. widow hangs on because she has to, and she's depending on that judge for justice. Jacob hangs on to this mysterious assailant because he has, he has to, in order to survive, he will not let go. And as I think about this task of preaching for preachers, a similar kind of tenacity for the text, for the stories, Mm. for the people in your pews, for their relationships, for their lives of faith, the 
thrive and flourish, that all emerges from this, from this wrestling mm-hmm. that I am sensing too. So it would be a real miss, I think, this week to clean up these stories and make them a simple equation of persistent faith equals blessing. To yeah. me, that's, you know, kind of a boring yeah. way of taking a story that is deeply exciting um, yeah. without also, you know, if you're going to say that, you know, of course there is that meaning, persistent faith does equal blessing. But you also need to say that there's the long night of struggle, that painful struggle in between. I think yeah. that's an important thing to underscore here. Let's not um, let's not clean up the picture. There's yeah. a, there's a fight involved. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, oh, well done. One of my favorites, but I really do mean that. This has long like since I mean I was young, been one of my absolute favorite stories, and you just did awesome with it, mm-hmm. friends. Take up the mantle, preach on Jacob this week, preach mm-hmm. the wrestle, the struggle, the fight, the grit. Um, I I guarantee you'll have some good conversations out of it. And on that note, that seems like a great place to stop for today. Rosie, thank you so much. This has been so fun. Pleasure. We hope that this has been as fun and as helpful to you as it was to us. You can find back episodes of firstreadingpodcast.com. While you're there, check out our snazzy merch or make a donation to support the podcast with our very friendly donate button. We really appreciate your support to help keep this resource going. Our gratitude also goes out to Trinity Lutheran Seminary at Capital University for a grant that they have given us to use for microphones, web costs, all great things to keep us going. And finally, we'd love to hear from you. How are you using the podcast? What are you finding helpful? What might you change? You can interact with us on our Facebook page or send an email to firstreadingpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Reverend Dr. Rachel Wren. And I'm Rosie Canipal. Thanks for listening and have an awesome week. <laughs>